Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out with us today. We are really grateful for you tuning in, and if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully, you've subscribed so that you never miss an episode, but if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com, or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on, and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We're bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership, and if you like the conversations in this podcast today, then I want to invite you to continue it with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of all previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations. And we're a pretty sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group, forums area, and WhatsApp chat groups. It's like Netflix for animal behavior nerds. To find out more about membership and how you can join the community and carry on the conversation, visit www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click the membership button in the main menu. But we will get started on today's episode, where we will be talking to one John McGuigan. John has been running a successful dog training and behavior modification business for over nine years. In that time, he has amassed over 4,500 hours of client-facing hours and has worked with over 2,000 dogs. Being a crossover trainer and having lived with dogs showing aggressive behaviors as a result of inappropriate training methods, he knows only too well the challenges faced by owners living with these issues. Much of his work is dealing and offering training and behavior solutions to owners living with dogs exhibiting aggressive behaviors. John focuses much of his teaching on the human movement and handling of the dog. Get that right, and it makes life much easier, he says. He has taught on several IMDT, Institute of Modern Dog Training courses, and hold regular tutorials for budding trainers and dog training enthusiasts throughout the year. He presents nationally and internationally on a variety of dog training topics. This year has seen him launch an online training platform, which you can find out more about over at glasgowdogtraineronline.thinkific.com. We'll link to that in the show notes. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome John to the show today. John, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, it's very good. Thank you. And I'm excited about this episode for everyone to listen to a Kiwi interview a Scottish. <laughs> They're going to get an overwhelm of accents today. Yeah, hopefully people will be able to understand both of us. <laughs> we might have to make it into a video and put subtitles on. <laughs> hey, we're going to dive straight into the first question today, John. Could you please take us back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and some of the first animals you ever trained using it? There's been... Probably around about 2000, yeah, 2000, uh, no, sorry, big part, 2010, there or thereabouts. Um, that's when I made um, the, the kind of big step in towards it. I'd seen elements of it before, but had not fully under, understood what was going on. So we had um, a little collie uh, around about when I got married, that was nine, uh, 99, 2000, when we had a little collie at the time. And I'd taken her to a dog club and the one of the trainers there, Joanne, she'd started showing me some stuff using a ball with Molly. Um, and then, unfortunately, there was, um, at the time, there was several kind of really popular uh, TV personalities that were um, extolling the virtues of uh, dominance-based training. And that's what I picked up. So kind of between then and around about 2000 and maybe over the next couple of years, I think, um, and maybe until, in fact, from 2001 up until probably 2000 and I'm just getting my dates mixed up here, right? 2006 or so, 2007, I was really heavily into correction-based training and dominance uh, methodology. And my now uh, partner, Helen, then got me more into the positive reinforcement uh, side. And from then, uh, it basically just took off. So I started reading more about it, learning more about it, and then applying it. And probably within after I started studying it properly, I think I stopped using even a verbal correction within maybe two years. 
So um, once I embraced it and actually started studying it and understanding it um, and then w- working out how to apply it properly, I then started seeing that there was not really any need for corrections or a really, really rare need for, for a correction with my dogs. And uh, yeah, and my dog's lives improved as a result of it. So we can thank your wife for the uh, transition, can we? But yeah, Helen, my now current white uh, partner. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And so, was it a, a steep learning curve for you in that two-year period from when you first learned about positive reinforcement to change everything you'd been doing up until that point, or was it a, a very easy? Uh, gradual transition how did that go um i think that well my background i, I was in the police for um 18 years and the entire culture um of my work and life had been based on you modify uh, people's behavior by being punitive and that was both within the organization and how we dealt with the public that's just the way that our justice system set up our traffic laws are set up to be punitive you know um criminal justice system set up to be punitive and the police is a um, I'll say apparently a disciplined organisation. <laughs> um, the rules to it, and if you break the rules, you get hammered for it. So um, it was a big cultural shift for me to move away from that and into a more uh, uh, positive reinforcement and compassionate way of learning. And uh, there was a, a cop that I used to work with, and I've known I'd known him for a long, long time. And this, he just uh, the book that he showed me was Paul Owen's Dog Whisperer. And he'd just bought a new puppy and this was the first book that he picked up, which was really fortunate for Andy that this was the first book that he picked up. And um, I said to him when I was talking to him, I says, what do you do if the dog gets it wrong? And he says, you don't do anything. He says, you just make sure you set your environment up so that she doesn't do the wrong thing the next time. And it, for me, it was kind of, but surely you have to tell her, you know. And he said, no, according to this guy, you don't. Um, and that was a big, that was, I can remember that as being quite a, a pivotal moment, thinking, yeah, how, how does that actually work then if you're not giving the learner feedback that they've got it wrong? So that kind of piqued my interest a little bit more and then started reading more about it and learning more about it. And before, a few weeks ago before, uh, when we caught up for a quick yeah. Skype call, we'll talk about this podcast, you were telling me some some pretty colourful stories. <laughs> About your police days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, you mentioned that you think that's beneficial to have you in your role because you're this guy with a, with a big beard and you've been in the police force and, you, and you're kind of demonstrating to everyone that you can be gentle and use positive yeah. reinforcement. Yeah. I think it, um, the – it made me examine, and this is probably a little bit more philosophical than getting into dog training here, but it, it, my, my journey into positive reinforcement-based training actually made me examine um, what it means to be uh, human and what it means to, be, means to be masculine. And we've got all these characteristics that we um, attach, all these labels that we attach to men and then a whole bunch of labels that we attach to women. And whereas they're actually not feminine or masculine characteristics, they're actually decent human characteristics. And we should be, as far as I'm concerned, um, these should be across the board. But I think that because, um, and again, these are broad sweeping generalizations here. We look at positive reinforcement um, dog training industries, certainly in the UK and in the States, as far as I can see, is hugely dominated by female trainers and female teachers. Whereas if we look more on a, um, a harsher approach, it seems to be dominated more by male personalities. And I think that's because uh, being hard or doing a ha- harder training methodology appeals to men be culturally. It is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be big and tough and macho and all this uh, rubbish. Whereas these are not, I don't think these are um, particularly admirable characteristics in a lot of situations. They are in some places. You know, um, but I don't think when you're dealing with your dog, your child, your co-worker, your spouse, that I think a more compassionate and kinder approach is, uh, I think it's more ethical and I think it's more effective. Yeah, so um, big cultural shift. Um, and I think that we actually need trainers, um, and it, it, it galls me to say it, um, but I, I think that we need more, oh, it's really sticking in my throat saying these words, I think we need more macho trainers um, training positive reinforcement. I don't think I'm a macho guy at all, um, but I think we need more more guys like me being out there um, uh, putting this stuff forward because I think that's how we'll make a change culturally with men. And so much of that sticks in my throat, but <laughs> um, the words are difficult to say, but it's, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a reality of things. And so with the people you've been helping, have you found that some of your clientele have gravitated towards you in, in that 
can I say, category of men. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, the, it's interesting because um, my the when I, if you were to look at my website, it actually we we now I think we we now a lot of of people who don't want to subscribe to this methodology anyway, which means that I think I should probably rewrite some of my website so that we cast a wider net. But um, the I think that a lot of my clients will self select anyway based on the information that I've put on my website when they're first contacting me. Uh, so um, the guys that I work with uh, and the men who are, I think probably maybe 15 or 20 percent of my client base are men, um, but every single one of them have, has a, 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 I don't even want to say the word softer, this is what's the problem we have, we don't even have the language for this stuff, um, a more compassionate outlook on, on life and in their relationships with their animals and with the other beings in their life. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, yeah, it's a million dollar question, I think, in our industry, how to appeal to more macho men. But uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not. So it's, it's kind of like we're providing a model to make it okay to be more compassionate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that that goes across the board. I mean, we were talking when we did our, our, our chat a few weeks ago. Um, I do um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as, as my hobby, and um, it's it's a hard sport. It's not, you know, it's um, it's not a needlepoint. You know, it's hard. And but when you you go across, you can travel the world and go to pretty much any Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gym and be welcomed with open arms. Um, really collegiate, really welcoming, uh, really n- good training, good teaching, and the vast majority of gyms that I've um, visited. So it's it's a uh, yeah, so it's it's possible um, within these male dominated environments that we, we actually can do this stuff uh, if we're singing from the same sheet. And I love hearing everyone's input about what we can do to help disseminate this information to everyone in our population. So thank you very much for sharing that, John. Thanks. Thank you. Moving forward, I'd really like to talk about Logan. I'm going <laughs> to just just going to have this as a very open-ended question and then we can we can narrow down into a, a number of topics here. But can you tell us okay. about Logan, John? Okay, so um, I first met him about, when would that be? So May, April, May 2016. And he had been, uh, there's a small animal charity uh, that I occasionally do work for. So they'll ask me sometimes to go up and look at one of their dogs uh, that they've brought in. And uh, they asked me to go and look at him. Uh, so his name was Tizer at the time. Tizer's a soft drink in England, um, kind of like Coca-Cola or, um, yes, yeah, Sprite. So it's, um, so his name was Tizer and uh, they brought him down to see me and uh he was the problem they wanted me to look at was he was fixating over when he was out on um, wood so he would grab a hold of branches um any fallen limbs from trees uh traffic cones was another thing that he particularly had a penchant for um so any and any time he would just grab a hold of this and then uh chew and chew and chew at it and not in any when i saw him it wasn't in any enjoyable way it was a a mass this is my interpretation of a massive release of stress from um he was about 28 kilos and he's now sitting about 32 or 33 so he was um, not massively underweight, but he looked like um, he looked like a prize fighter at a weigh-in. You know that really gone um, strung out, uh, just sitting on his nerves, um, kind of being. And they wanted me to go down and look at him and then do work with him to get him ready for adoption. And <laughs> it's like, it's, he's, nobody's adopting this dog. He's unadoptable. You know, he's got too many problems and he needs a, it's a, a, a long strategy that he, he needs. So I worked with him a few times over the summer. And I, I mean, a few times, it was like four times that I had time to go up and see him. And then after about the third or fourth time, I was like, he's either going to get put to sleep or he's going to come home with me you know um and uh so i made a decision that i was going to do a long-term foster of him and that was a year past in december so december 16 and we brought him home and yeah and it's been the last 14 months have been a massive learning curve uh, for me our other little dog watson who's a little kelpie looking one she'd been she had been a quite a difficult dog to work with um, and if I hadn't had the previous two years nearly experience with Watson, I would have had no clue what to do with Logan. 
Um, and there was a couple of times when I was working with him, and I would, and I actually, and I remember saying these words to him: "Say, I know you're struggling, pal, and I'm really trying to help you. I've got zero idea what I'm doing with you." Um, yeah. And so the foster period's obviously gone on for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think probably after two months, I was like, "He's staying. He's not going anywhere," you know. And um, I just um, every new experience. I think the, the way that I look at it, he's had. Um, a tiny range of um, behaviours which have been reinforced with a tiny range of reinforcers. So he has really got no scope. Um, everything was fixating on, I'm going to grab stuff and crush it. Um, you know, again, c- cones, trees. Um, and any time his uh, arousal went up, and it's made me actually think about what arousal is and what it isn't. And when his arousal became high or became stressed, he would then immediately look for something to grab a hold of. And so it was, that was, a, it, those behaviors were really a symptom of lots of underlying stuff that was going on with him. And he just started doing some clicker training with him and I was able to do five minutes and then that would be him for like three or four days. And I, and I, I learned this because I was learning, I was going with it. I would try and do something with him in the morning and then something with him in the afternoon. And then, and these were five minute sessions. I mean, that's as long as they were. And then if I tried him again the next day, it, it just blew his mind. He just needed that a huge amount of time to recover from every new experience that he had. So uh, we let him sleep all the time, really limited the range of exposure that he had to stuff that he couldn't cope with and uh, just gradually started expanding it out. So he doesn't like dogs um, and he doesn't like uh, people that he doesn't know get in any space. He really doesn't like surprises. I think that's probably the easiest way really sensitive to environmental change. So um, we had to build all those skills in him uh, and by doing <laughs> five minutes at a time, three or four times a week, you know, and then building that up to five minutes at a time every day and then six or seven minutes at a time, three or four times a week and then six or seven minutes times a day and so on and so on. So you needed to learn such a massive amount to be a citizen of this world um, and we're still not there yet. I think he's a four-year project. So you brought him home and said, Helen, I have a new project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so, at that, so where, where did you start? You kind of just brought him home and you – just started trying things you already had a rough yeah. idea nope had zero clue it took him um we had uh so the, now this is the time scales i don't think he's unique but i think he's a rare dog um so it took him uh three months before he would sniff the ground outside and um, it wasn't in the garden um four months before he took food outside uh and um, anything you tried to get move away from you um so we did lots of standing around watching stuff uh, and so those things like him taking food that that's now an indicator really easily for me of, of how he's feeling if I offer him a piece of food and he will he will bypass my hand to continue to look at whatever he's interested in um, so it's uh, yeah so we, we, I tried lots of stuff playing toys with him uh, playing games with him so chase stuff tug um, that would put his arousal level through the roof uh, and um, yeah, so there's lots of interesting behaviours come out as a result of that. If he, um, I don't know if it's frustration with them. Uh, just <laughs> honestly, I, I make a joke that I had a full. My, my beard was completely dark before I bought him, and it's now completely white. <laughs> you know, full head of dark hair before I got him. It's been yeah, it's it's been pretty stressful but it's been really interesting as well it has been because he's a puzzle to be helped i don't think he's a puzzle to be solved but he's certainly a puzzle to be helped so i have a couple of questions uh first one let's just build upon something you said that you said you feel like you've discovered what arousal is and what it is not yeah okay so um lindsay wood brown she's um um on the faculty at Cairn Pryor academy so she I'm chatting to her about it as well and her view, which we've had some backwards and forwards over this and it is stuff to, it's planting the seeds so that we can go and think about it. She views arousal as being like drive as and it's not a thing. It's a combination of 
uh, environmental influences which change a dog's behaviour. So lots of it's in the antecedents, whereas I'm more inclined to think that it's um, as a consequence of poor training and poor reinforcement history. So I don't, and I'm still, uh, so this might be a little bit disjointed as I'm saying it, because I'm still trying to formulate these thoughts in my head. Um, by not, when we, we label the dog as high drive, what does that mean? Um, and I, that, that's not an expression that I'll use at all. Um, but similarly, we could actually say if the dog's highly aroused. So I am more inclined to think that it's an emotional state, the same as a behavior is, uh, which is subject to environmental conditions and reinforcement. So that's what I actually think arousal is. And I will absolutely stand to be corrected on that. Um, yeah. So we've had to do a lots of stuff with raising and lowering that arousal so that he's able to still perform and listen to me, receive reinforcement, move with me, you know, and all those things that go with these high arousal dogs for want of whatever that label is. So I told you it would be disjointed. No, it's, it's good. It's good to have this opportunity to get on here and hopefully get everyone who's listening, thinking, and potentially some input from others as well. You, you, you talk about raising and lowering the arousal. Can you walk us through what you mean by this? Okay, so in the house, um, he can play. Um, he, when we're playing with toys, it's actually not that playful. So when you're, um, when I watch him playing with Watson and he plays with Watson, it is play. It is backwards and forwards, nice relaxed behaviour. They wrestle, they chase. When I am playing with them, either with a tug toy uh, or something for them to catch, it is what I see. It's more about predation. So it's going into that um, predatory sequence that um, dogs have. So I've done uh, what I do with that is when he is kind of in that zone, what I'll do is I'll play a little bit with him so that his arousal level will raise and that I measure that by how much he's vocalising, um, how quickly he can let go of the toy, is he able to take food during that play session, and then how quickly he is able to go back to a kind of normal state afterwards. So those are all the factors that I look at when I'm playing with him. And the problem that we have when we're doing this with him is if I don't give him enough of that play, then he gets he gets frustrated. It's like getting a t- piece of cho- a, a tiny taste of chocolate cake, and then the whole the rest of the slice being taken from you. So it's I need to satisfy enough of him, enough of that need that he has for that play, which is not play, which we talked about, um, but not give him too much that he's then out of his mind and can't actually focus or think. Um, and I've seen lots of this stuff. Um, my background in the police has actually been really helpful because I've seen lots of this stuff in humans. Um, both with uh, the guys that I used to work with, uh, which are a joy to work with when you get guys like this, or um, guys that you're trying to arrest um, who are really highly aroused or highly emotionally charged. Um, so it, it's holding them in that bracket of can. But I think this is a problem that we have with um, not we, people who train sports dogs have is trying to keep the dog in that performance state that they are motivated highly to do the behaviour but not motivated so much for the reinforcement that they then can't do the behaviour because they're tripping at a too high arousal. Um, so we do lots of short games and then multiple games over and over again. So um, he will switch from one toy to the next while the, other, the toy that he's got still moves. Um, he drops the toy when I ask him to. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that's the kind of stuff that we've done and we're, we're just continuing to expand that out to broaden that range of experience that he has and then you talked about the influence when when managing that how we view it with regards to antecedents versus consequences and how they influence that have i yeah yeah so i i still don't know um and when i spoke to Lindsay about that as well she says that she doesn't have all the answers for that as well which is why these conversations are important so that we can try and work it out um, because we don't get access to Ken Ramirez and Susan Friedman every day of the week. <laughs> you know? uh, so the if I have played with him briefly, that play or that just minutes before reinforcement history is now part of the antecedents for the next round of behaviour. 
So that's why I'm inclined to think that it's probably a little from column A and a little from column C. Um, and in the early stages, maybe six months ago, um, I was able to, if I started playing with them very, very, very quickly, could then see this is not going to be a good training session and we're going to have to stop it. Um, and then I would look at what we'd done the previous day or the previous two days. You know, has he et, eaten enough? Has he slept enough? Have we tried new things the day or two days beforehand? Is he just um, stacked, you know, trigger stacking? But the, with him, the, the trigger stacking seemed to be fairly distant. So it would be, you know, it could be two hours, sorry, two days beforehand. So I would have to keep notes of all this stuff about what I did in order to try and um, get a pattern and then have an identified no discernible pattern then had to do it by... <laughs> kind of feeling and observing how he was in the moment uh, and that that's difficult um, and yeah so that that's kind of how I viewed it and what I did in order to try and um, reduce that arousal level yes and I, I'm looking forward to, to listening to this back and, and continuing time for this to marinate in the mind and then uh, work towards getting the program set up where we've got Dr. Fredman and Ken Ramirez on call 24 hours a day yeah, how cool would that be? So you're in a session or contemplating doing a session or situation with Logan. Logan does a behavior, you deliver a consequence, which increases arousal. And this dictates what's going to happen next, potentially, is what you're saying, as opposed to what's happening in the environment. Yeah, that's what I think. That, that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah. And you've got a video about this, don't you? And we're going to share that in a write-up. Yeah, I've got, I've got tons and tons of other videos. I've got hundreds of hours of video of them, which I just need to sift through and edit a lot of it. It's a good project. And and you know, and so because you've got this in a blog, don't you? You've got a video blog. Yeah, yeah. So I do the, the blog that I've got is on my own blog. So that's Glasgow Dog Trainer dot dot com and um, we're now up to I think we're nearly 30 parts or something um, so it's both video and uh, video and written blog so I do both uh, and I will do a blog when I have the time or when there's something um, interesting that I have observed with them uh, it's also this is why I should blog more um, it's actually just to keep a record of what I'm doing with them and where he's progressing because these tiny incremental improvements that uh, we make if I'm not recording them then they just kind of disappear into the ether and you just think that's what he's like so the um, yeah so there's video there um, and then there's written description of, of them as well of what's going on and so you have to record more of this said every dog trainer who films their training ever <laughs> And yep. you've obviously learned a lot from being able to watch this stuff back. Yeah, it's stuff that you're missing in the moment because you're too busy concentrating and keeping both of you safe, you know, so that he's not um, – because, he, he, I mean, a couple of times he's, he's the, the training vest that I wear, he, he jumps up and grabs at the pocket because the toy's there and or not there. Uh, so it's then saying to him, we've ended that session, let's cool off. You know, give you a massage, um, get you a big drink of water, and let's go and chill out. You know, so but that's that's the bit that he finds difficult, especially after these play sessions, is that he then has difficulty coming back down to that baseline again. And one thing I thought was beneficial for people listening, uh, and myself, and as we move forward, is when you were talking about arousal, you had some very clearly defined behaviours that you used to, yeah, to the best of your ability. Yeah, yeah. So with him, it is he will uh, refuse food, fixate on the fixate by scanning the environment, and that there's very often nothing there that I can identify. So it's not as if it's a person or a dog walking past. He will just stand and stare into space, and it looks as if he's looking for stuff. It's not as if he's just zoned out and he's standing staring, you know, the thousand yard stare. He is actually looking, um, and it's it's scanning the environment. Uh, uh, he can, and there's a combination of all these things. Um, he will bounce backwards, barking at me. Um, and when when I first started working with him uh, last, so that was nearly so that would have been summer 2016. He I took him out to the countryside uh, at the edge of the city, and um, he bounced backwards, barking at me for 45 minutes without a break it was an absolute joy so and uh yeah and i had no ball no toy with them you know i was actually saying can you come out you know take you out the kennels and let's go for a sniff in the countryside and um he just 
But that's where I think that that antecedent part comes into it, that he has made such a strong association in the past that if he is in an open space with greenery around, it is about play. It is about grabbing branches or fixating on a ball or, you know, all these types of behaviours. So um, those are the things that he, that I identify as him being highly aroused, refusal of food, fixation on scanning the environment and or bouncing backwards barking at me, which means I've got measurable criteria that I can now sit and say how much of the time is he doing those things. You know, and how much of the time is he doing other things? So we had a beautiful walk this afternoon where he, I think he barked twice at me. And we were out of the park for about 45 minutes with other dogs and people around. And yeah, it was outstanding. It was really, yeah, really, really good session with him today. Yeah, excited to hear that. And, and it's congratulations, the right way to say. Yeah, yeah I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think thanks. Congratulations <laughs> to both you and Logan. Uh, yeah, he's doing well. And we'll move on because I've got, as always, okay. a, a page full of questions. But we will push on. If you listening want to learn more about Logan and his and John's journey and have a look at some of the videos and John's thoughts in the blog, can you just remind everyone once again before we do move on where they can find that, John? So they'll get it on my Facebook, which is Glasgow Dog Trainer and Behaviour Consultant. And if you look at the video tabs uh, or under the videos tab there, you'll see lots of video. Uh, and the blog is glasgodogtrainer.wordpress.com. And thank you so much for sharing, John. The next question I wanted to talk about was something that's very exciting because there's been a recent change in legislation in your country, hasn't there, with regards to e-collars for dogs. Can you tell us about this? Yeah. So the um, there's been a ban the shot collar um, campaign um, in Scotland for the last few years, uh, which has been headed up by a group of trainers. And the uh, so th- for those of you that don't know, um, so Scotland's still part of the UK. We have Westminster, which covers national issues. Um, sorry, UK issues. And we also have a Scottish Parliament, which covers um, Scottish issues. And Animal welfare is a devolved uh, matter, so it's been devolved to the Scottish Parliament. So the the group has been campaigning um, the Scot or petitioning the Scottish Parliament for several years now. And in November last year, they um, we, they got it as far as it wasn't an outright ban on the use of e-collars. What they were going to do is um, allow for the licensing of a hundred qualified trainers. They were then going to be qualified and licensed to use e-collars under certain conditions. And the conditions were, um, as a last resort, under the vet guidance. And the the proposals were actually there was so much um, room for manoeuvring them that they, they would have been so easy to get around. Who's a qualified trainer? Who's a qualified vet? What does guidance um, look like? Uh, and who decides what is a last resort? So there was so much stuff going on there. And then Helen, my good lady, um, and I am not in, in no way um, am I are, am I saying that this is our doing or, or Helen's. Um, it was a, a, a global effort from lots of people across the, the board in Scotland. Uh, but Helen, in uh, a few months ago, started petitioning. She wrote to our member of Scottish Parliament, and who is um, it's a Scottish nationalist government. They have an, we've got an SNP uh, MSP, so a nationalist M- M- member of Parliament. So she went to him. Uh, were then able to take that further on to the uh, Rosanna Cunningham, the culture sec- or the secretary who deals with these issues. And uh, Helen was able to directly influence the government's decision, which was absolutely amazing. It's uh, just a, 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 it's yeah, I, I couldn't be proud, more proud of her. So, um, and the 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 argument that she made was that um, we don't um, punishment is our, our government accepts that punishment is actually not uh, a particularly effective way of uh, um, having long lasting behaviour change. So we we don't have nuclear or our government does not want nuclear weapons and doesn't want nuclear weapons in Scotland. We have outlawed um, corporal punishment of children, full stop. So you can't raise your hand to your child in Scotland. It's a criminal offence. 
And she used that the, that same logic to say to them, why are we still using instruments that can cause pain and suffering as a means of uh, modifying our, our dog's behaviour? Um, and as a result of that argument, the government changed their mind and they've issued uh, the guidance, which I'm going to talk about in a second, um, but the, the legislation will be an amendment to an existing act and it will probably come into effect within the next couple of months. So um, now what we have is the, um, the wording of the legislation is guidance, but it's guidance with a capital G, which has specific meaning in law. So it's not guidance as in these are guidelines that we can kind of choose to look at or not. It is guidance with a capital G, which has specific meaning which means that the use of um, e-collars and other uh, tools which cause pain and suffering will be outlawed in uh, training in Scotland, which is wonderful. So I'm thinking as I sit here and listen to your story, and once again, congratulations, and that is the great word this time. Yeah, that is, uh, it's, it's wonderful news. Yeah. I want to raise the question how we globally can learn from this moving forward because I know that I can walk down to my pet store within 10 minute drive I'm not going to walk if I'm driving I drive to my to a a pet store which is about 10 minutes away there's a whole cabinet full of e-collars can we get a copy of Helen's letter (laughs) basically and just (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, I can get that to you and that's not a problem um I don't know. I think that the I think the can again just looking at with with all these things, the conditions just have just been right um, for this to happen. But if the 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 people who worked tirelessly um, for this result hadn't done what they'd done, then the conditions may not have changed to allow it in the first place, and uh, and then it, it wouldn't have happened. So it's just it is. What I would say is that we ju- we just keep doing it. We just keep trying, um, and we could easily have accepted. And and that's it was a big um, it was quite a big blow in November when they said that they were going to authorise these hundred licensed trainers. Uh, and a lot of people will then say, "Well, that's it. We give up." And you're like, "No, there's, there's you know, there our elected representatives. They um, they run the country on our behalf, and our voice should be listened to in a democracy." And uh, yeah, so um, I think as well, um, Scotland politically is progressive, um, and it's and I'm gonna I'll be careful about the politics here because people aren't here to listen to my political views, but. Uh, I think um, Scotland is a fairly progressive um, country politically. Um, we've got good attitudes towards immigration, good attitudes towards uh, nas- the National Health Service, education, housing, and a whole bunch of other things. So we have um, that is who we are as a country, and I think that is what Helen appealed to with the representatives that she spoke to. So I think if your culture is slightly different in your country, you may have more difficulty. So. Firstly, if you're somebody who has taken action in whatever way, shape or form to move towards the banning of e-collars in your country, keep chipping away. Yeah, absolutely. Look at look at the yeah. legislation because we're going to have you, – you found a way to leverage what legislation there already was to, to get yeah. your I, – I was going to say ideas, but I don't think that's the right word to, – to communicate – yeah. Why this wasn't correct? Why this wasn't right? So, so look at the legislation in your your own country. Would you say um, use Scotland as an example now? Yeah, without a doubt. Wales did it. Wales did it a few years ago. They banned um, elect- the use of electric collars with training their dogs. Um, so it, it can be done. Um, lots of Scandinavian countries. Um, well, not, there's only five of them anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> several Scandinavian countries uh, don't allow. And I actually think it might be all of them. I'm not sure about Finland, but I know Sweden and Denmark. I'm pretty sure. I know Sweden definitely. You can't use an e-collar. So there, it, it can be done, you know. Um, and it can only be done if we keep doing it. But this week is the hundredth anniversary in the UK of women getting the vote. So that is the change that we have if we um, voice uh, our democratic right. And I know that I'm getting a little bit politi- political there, but this is this is how we change stuff by like campaigning. So in your country, there's obviously people who train with e-collars. These people are going to have to make the change now. I'm thinking yeah. of areas. I know that there are some uses of e-collars, for example, aversion training. 
yeah. dogs who are involved in conservation. So I know of some programs where dogs are trained to averse, to leave an endangered species alone, and it's trained via yes. of e collars. Uh, and is, is in Scotland that is now something that couldn't happen. Was yeah. there stuff like that happening in Scotland? I'm brainstorming. No. Yeah, no. The, the, as far as I know, the, the application um, that were um, of e collars and training were for sports dogs, so um, IPO, um, gun dog training. Uh, so the, the sports that we've traditionally used uh, pretty punitive training methods anyway. So they were, and they, they weren't hugely popular, but they were used and they weren't uncommon. You know, so I'm not out saying that every trainer that's out there training a gun dog is using an e-collar on their dog. Because uh, what I would want to say to them is, what did you do in the 1930s? We've been shooting game birds in Scotland for 100 years, you know. So, but what did we do before we had an e-collar? How did we train our dog? But that's a different argument. Um, so, uh, so it was those were um, and for um, behaviour modification. So lots, um, not lots, but enough using uh, e-collars and prong collars for aggression problems, which we know is fraught with danger anyway when you're using aversives for to get a dog to stop being aggressive without dealing with the underlying reason for their aggression. So those were the the, the, the more common reasons for using um, e-collars um, in Scotland. Yeah, I think I think that would be universal, and I'm, and I'm not by any means saying that, that it's an appropriate use of an e-collar to train a dog to be averse to an, an endangered species. Obviously, there's yeah. alternatives available for us that are much better for everyone involved. I'm just trying to brainstorm all of yeah. No, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. all the all the different yeah, yeah. applications and of, challenges yeah. people are going to face as we move forward in our own countries, in our own respective countries. Yeah. Uh, writing letters to governments and politicians and and all this kind of stuff. Non emotional arguments as well, you know. So argue at it from a um, from a welfare point of view, from a scientific point of view. Um, and I think that the the more non emotional we are about this, because it's an emotive issue. But I think stating in terms of logic and facts and science uh, is the way to go. And are we able to share Helen's letter? Uh, I will do my best to get that to you. All right. So I'll see you. Cool. That would be fin- really, really beneficial, I think. Um, but obviously understandable yeah, yeah. if there's some reason why that can't happen. Great information, obviously. And I know there's loads of people who are listening to this show for whom this is going to be highly beneficial. So once again, thank you so much for sharing, John. No, thanks for the opportunity to share it as well. It's, it's important. very important and I'm excited that this is going to be going to thousands of people's ears around the world once released. We're now going to head into one of my favorite parts of the podcast show and I call this story time. John, can you please share with everyone listening two or three stories from your experience training animals so far and some of the important lessons that these have taught you along the way? Uh, it's interesting because I was listening to your um, podcast last night with uh, Teresa uh, and when she was saying that when it gets to this part, everybody gives really poignant stories. I don't have poignant stories for you about this. So um, the with Logan, it has um, my, my journey with him over the last fourteen months um, has hugely opened my eye to my eyes to being really having to get into um, the detail of this. Um, we hosted Susan Friedman last July, and I spoke to her at length about him, and she said to me, "Trust the science; it will work." And um, because it's lawful, so she just says, "Just trust the science." Um, and that's what I did. Uh, and now the, the, the difficulty that if we don't trust the science is that we don't get enough reinforcement. So our behavior of trying this over and over again is not being reinforced well enough. Um, so you need to uh, then concentrate and uh, wire yourself to view these tiny improvements so that you're being reinforced or our behavior has been reinforced uh, well enough to continue doing what you're doing. Um, and in the intro that you put out, I spend a lot of time, because my previous history or my background has really been about human behavior, I spend a lot of time looking at that part of it because if we, the, our, our behavior is either part of our dog's antecedents or consequences. Um, so that's what modifies the behavior. Um, and by paying more attention to what we are doing and how we are behaving, then it makes 
uh, it makes your journey easier and it makes what we're doing easier with our dogs. So um, I know that's not really specific to learning with animals, but it's certainly something that, that I think is helpful. Um, yeah. Uh, then to, you know, because when you, when you, you'd, um, when you sent me the, the questions that you were going to ask, another couple of ones were, um, again, um, and I know that everybody that comes on to this podcast talks about uh, Susan Friedman, uh, the, and, and, and rightly so because of how influential she's been. Um, I was at a seminar with her in Denmark a few years ago and two years ago coming up. And, um, the, when she'd mentioned that the functional behavior or a behavior's function, it was that way, you know, that when you're sitting and you're kind of, you're, you're, you're sitting on the cusp of understanding it, but you kind of get it, but kind of don't, you know what the words mean, but you don't have a really good understanding of what that actually is. So we had, um, it was a three day seminar and between day one and day two, we had changed the seats over in the seminar room and, uh, to be more, the more comfortable seats. So the janitor came in in the morning of day two and started shouting at us in Danish. And, uh, now my reaction immediately would have been, having been confronted with that, would have been to actually meet that with force. Um, like, can I tell him to stop shouting and, you know, that kind of thing. So that, that would, would have been my immediate reaction based on my own learning experience. And Susan turned around to the interpreter and says, ask him how we can help him. And at, at that moment, I was like, ah, right. <laughs> that's the function of his shouting. <laughs> you know, that's why he's shouting because he needs help or he needs an, he's looking for, um, he's looking for something to be achieved by his shouting. And it was a real eye opener that one moment. But it's interesting where you get your um, where you get these learning points, and you sit there and look at that and go, "All oh, right, okay, that's what that actually means." But again, that comes into being the the right experience at the right moment based on your previous learning history. So, kind of a culmination of a number of factors, and that happens with your dog as well. And the last one, uh, which is a kind of funny story. Um, I worked 10 years in uniform and then I was eight years in plain clothes. So I'd gone in, the first kind of plain clothes assignment I had, it was, uh, we were, uh, it was arrest warrants. So we would get a whole bunch of uh, arrest warrants at the beginning of the month and then go and have to trace all the people who hadn't turned up at court or hadn't paid their fines. So one Sunday evening, um, and when you, you make the, and lots of police officers find this when they make the transition from uniform to plain clothes is they actually have to change their approach because the uniform is not then there to help them. It's not there as a sign of authority. So they're actually, it humanizes um, a lot of cops. So we've gone to this guy's door on a Sunday night and we were locking him up and in it's public housing. Um, there was some of the houses are pretty run down, but anyway, he's a recovering drug addict and I opened the door to us and he's, Annoyed and angry and that we're spoiling his Sunday evening um, and he's going to get locked up and he's going to court the next day. He's, now, this guy is, I'd known him a little while beforehand and he had started to turn his life around. So he had this new flat, he'd done lots of, uh, he painted it well, he'd done a little bit of decoration with it and it, it looked nice. And I said to him, who did, you, who, who helped you decorate your flat? And immediately he was like, what? You know, because he thought I was being obnoxious, you know. And I said to him, you've made a really cracking job with your flat. I says, who, who and he said, no, I did it all myself. And I was like, this is really cool. And see, as soon as I started dealing with him like that, rather than having a punitive approach to him and meeting his anger with anger, then he softened. He was massively compliant. We chatted in the, the, the trip to the, um, the office, um, took him in the cells, got him a cup of tea, and that 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 changed how I actually interacted with a lot of the people that I came into contact with subsequently. Um, and I wish I'd have known if I'd have known what I know about behaviour now, twenty two years ago, whenever it was. Yeah, twenty two years ago when I joined the police, I would have had a different um, career and had a lot less aggravation as well. I think so. Yeah, so that's just different ways to that I have learned to look at behaviour and take these examples out um, of your own learning and say, right, although that's what actually happened there. And can we apply that to our colleague, to our dog, to our spouse, to our child? So the takeaway message are to, is to trust the science, seek out yep. those light bulb moments, which are going to be significantly increased if you hang out with Dr. Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so. <laughs> we just need to download our brain, you know, so just download our brain somewhere. All right, we'll get into that. Uh, moving forward in 2018, <laughs> and then it would be available 24-7. So yeah. I just want to, before we move on, 
focus on one thing that you talked about there because I think it's something that everyone can relate to, whether they're training their animals or other areas of their life. And and we've had someone on the show before, quoting Dr. Fredman actually, who said, trust the science, trust the process. And it's something that re- res- yeah. rings in my mind all, all the time when I'm watching training, when I'm doing my own training. And you said that when you're in a tra- challenging situation, for example, maybe some of the stuff you've been doing with Logan over the last wee while, you've got to trust the process and you've got yeah. to wire yourself yeah. to be reinforced by the small successes. Ha- any yeah. any input on how we can do this? Video is good because you can then look back and see what improvements that you made, um, taking some records for it. Uh, um, so even if that's just brief notes at the end of every day that you've worked with your dog, um, because lots of people have challenging dogs um, and they're challenging for their own level of ability. So, um, yeah, so just, yeah, and I think actually starting to train. Uh, one of the things that I do, and this is, yeah, one of the things that I say to, so we use, um, I recommend Cathy Sedeo's, um Smart Times 50 protocol for uh, to jumpstart training sessions or, or to change the way they're training. So if, if you don't know what Smart 50 is, it's uh, the Smarts are uh, uh, um, abbreviation for C-Mark and reinforce training. So we see the behavior that we like, we mark it with a verbal marker, and then we reinforce it with um, a treat. So, and 50 times a day. So over the course of a month, we've now reinforced 1500 times behavior that we like and when I explain it to clients I say to them this will make you start seeing your dog's good behavior and that your dog is not a nightmare all of the time your dog does not bark 24 7 your dog does not dig all the time and chew your furniture all the time so you're now starting to train your eye and your ear to notice behaviors that you like and I think that we need to start doing that with us as well so you then it's you then training yourself to see Oh, that was actually a really good moment there. And then what allowed that to happen? Uh, we were the right distance from the dog or my reinforcement for the previous three repetitions was bang on. The dog has had enough to eat, enough to drink and has as well rested that day. And so am I. So you're then able to look at all those antecedents which allowed that to happen and then examine the reinforcement, which will then look at what's going to happen again. Um, yeah, so it's just a, a shift in perspective to start noticing the cool stuff both in your dog's life and in your own life because we're built from an evolutionary point of view to pay atten- more attention to the bad stuff because that's what keeps us alive. No point in smelling a flower if you don't hear the bear coming up behind you. <laughs> well, you exceeded my expectations of your answer to that question. I love that. <laughs> Thanks. Sadly, now though, that does bring us to our last question for this episode. John, could you please take us all into your future? into the future and share with us what you would like to see happen over the next five to ten years in the animal and dog training world. So been doing some business development um, and uh, over the last uh, couple of months and um, been working with a guy who does um, business advice for sh- or, uh, small businesses and one of the things he got, one of the exercises was your mission and your vision. Okay, so um, And he said, be as broad as you want. So it's Kind of like the old Miss World, um, what's your vision for the future? I want world peace. So kind of like that, you know, and um, looking at what if your if your resources were unlimited and your ability was unlimited and your influence was so much greater than it was, what would you actually look for in the future? And what the couple of things that we I identified was to bring this this type of training to all owners and all dogs. So that's what I would like to. That's that's the mission that I'm on. That's the that's what I that's the path that that we are on uh, in order to bring this style of training um, to everybody. And the vision that I have for the next five years, ten years, twenty years is for people to be more educated in what behaviour is and what it's not, um, so that people get a greater understanding of behaviour. Because if we understand what behaviour is for, it means you can then uh, influence all of our relationships within your family, within your community, within your town, your country and globally through looking at behavior properly. Um, and yeah, so that, that's what I that's what I would like to see happen. And the way that we do that is by all continuing to support each other. So this community that we have, so 
me talking to you. Um, we've got a whole bunch of trainers. So the people that you've had in your podcast before, these are people that that I have um, you know, uh, professional relationships with, uh, some of them. And we build these up and then we support each other. We promote each other's um, material. Uh, and if you don't like it, that's okay. You just then don't need, but you just don't need to badmouth them, you know. Which is um, so. It's actually having a positive reinforcement attitude in all of your dealings. So that's that's what I see as my vision for the future. That's what I would like to see happening. It's a great vision, and it's worth repeating. So can I ask you to just repeat one thing, and that was the the questions that your person who's helping you out with your business stuff made you ask yourself. Yeah. So with unlimited resources, unlimited time, and unlimited influence, um, what would you envision for? And and the, the, the question for me was your business, but it could be your life, your community, your country, your after that, your dog, um, because that's what we're striving towards. Now, if we never reach that goal, that's okay. But what happens then is it informs all of your actions. So very briefly, just going back, and I have a... I have a vision for the behavior that I want Logan to exhibit for his welfare and everything that I do, all my interactions with him and from how I handle the lead to how I deliver reinforcement to how I move and when I decide to start or end a training session, all of those things are informed by that vision that I have from him. So it basically is a big, huge, multi-part back chain, <laughs> you know, Start at the end and just work your whole way back, you know, and just do the next step backwards from that. So, um, or chain, or chain, actually, yeah, a chain. Um, so that's, I think that if we actually start thinking in those terms, what we can achieve is, is pretty limitless. Unlimited time, unlimited money, unlimited resources, and unlimited resources. influence. Yeah, yeah. If you had that, you definitely what would you do? Ban e collars in more countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could bring out this training to the masses um, across the globe. You know, so some guy living in the mountains of Mongolia would still be able to have access to this stuff. You know, if you had unlimited resources. And we don't, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do everything that we can because it's just ripples. So that's a great vision. And we are, of course, working really hard to make these things transpire as we move forward over the coming years. That does sadly bring us to the final little segment, though. John, can you please tell people listening where they can go to find out more about you, your book, online courses, and the ripples you're creating? Okay, so um, Facebook, which is probably the most active social media, and it's Glasgow Dog Trainer and Behaviour Consultant. Uh, YouTube, search for me under Glasgow Dog Trainer. Uh, my website, which you'll get access to all of these things, is glasgowdogtrainer.co.uk and the social media buttons are on the homepage at the bottom. Uh, my blog is on that page as well. Uh, and I don't really use Twitter. Uh, um, Instagram as well, um, and I, I use that occasionally too. But um, Facebook and YouTube and my blog are the, the three main ones that you'll see the work that I do. Uh, and then the online training academy is Glasgow Dog Trainer Online dot think ethic i f i c dot com and there's a couple of courses available just now but I'm I'm building that this year. That's exciting. And we'll link to all of his stuff in the show notes. Uh, good move from my understanding. Twitter's on its way up, Instagram on its way up. So <laughs> sounds good there, John. Well, and briefly, Ryan, I, put the, the, um, I recently uh, published just a short book. Um, so if you search for John McGuigan on your Amazon in your country, uh, you'll get both the ebook for your Kindle or there's uh, um, the paperbacks there as well. And it's the five um, most common dog training problems and solutions for those. And it's not expensive. And talking about creating ripples, it is we can say it's a number one bestseller on Amazon, can't we? It is, yeah, yeah. Which was uh, it was a, a good achievement, so I'm happy with that. Yeah, Amazon number one bestselling author, which I never thought those words would come out of my mouth. Ripples, bitches. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for sharing everything today, John. So, no, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. The pleasure is all ours. So we really appreciate you taking the time, uh, and just super grateful for you and everything you're doing. Cheers. Thank, thanks a lot. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. 
and I want to ask a small favor of those listening. If you enjoyed this episode today and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about the most positive and less intrusive ways of influencing behavior, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. So come on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and check out what's on offer. You can click on the membership button in the main menu to learn all about how you can connect with like-minded, positive reinforcement behavior nerds from around the world. Whether you train or thinking about training dogs, cats, pets, birds, zoo animals, whatever, anything that has a pulse and implementing techniques within your vet clinic or any other area where behavior management is required, you will love all the different ways you can join in. Forums, WhatsApp, private Facebook group, live web classes, there's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the family. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening. But for now, we'll see you later, alligator. You'll hear from us again soon.